Hello, everyone, and welcome to Song and Beyond on idagio.com in cooperation with the Hampsong Foundation. My name is Steve Rogers. I'm a professor of music theory at the University of Oregon, and I'm delighted to be guest hosting Song and Beyond for the month of April. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Thomas Hampson and Christy Finn, the managing director of the Hamsong Foundation for inviting me to do this, and to thank my two guests today, Marion Wilson Kimber from the University of Iowa and Chris Reynolds from University of California Davis, who are joining me in conversation today. I'll be talking with a number of people over the course of the month about women and song. And Marion and Chris, I have to say that the two of you were the first people who came to mind when I was asked to do this because I'm so, uh, I admire the work that you've done on women in song so much. You're, you're both uh, wonderful people who do, who do great scholarship. And this seemed like a good way to start because both of you are very active with the Women's Song Forum, the forum that I discussed with Thomas Hampson in our last conversation. And you both focus on songs by women in the late 19th century uh, into the early 20th century. And that's the time period that we'll focus on today in our conversation. So thank you so much for being here. I'm really delighted to get a chance to talk to both of you. And Chris, I think I'll start with you since in, in so many ways, you were the person who had the idea to create the Women's Song Forum. Could you tell me how the idea came about, how it developed, and maybe talk a bit about um, how the project came, came to being once, once you had this idea to create a website? Sure. Um, a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, I thought I would post on my Facebook wall a song a day by a woman and um, with a little paragraph of explanation about why I thought this song was worth listening to. And um, it went fine. I did two weeks. I, when I started, I said, you know, this could be a short thing. It could go on and on because indeed there are hundreds of women uh, who wrote songs a century ago. Um, but after two weeks, I thought, you know, this is not the right medium. Um, uh, some of the songs were liked by many people and others not, and there was very little feedback. So I thought, um, I know there are a few people, and Steve, you were one of them, uh, who are interested in this, uh, but really what I think I am uh, needing is a blog. And so I've, I, after two weeks, I said, thanks, this has been fun. I'm going to go on and do other things um, and let it sit until the summer. And then I talked to you and to a few other people, um, Steve, and quickly Marion um, was one of the one who had to be included. And initially I was thinking, well, maybe five or six of us could could do a blog and then well what about so and so and what about so and so and we don't have this area of song covered laura tunbridge was one of the ones who suggested that in fact my idea of a forum which dealt with songs a century ago was too narrow um, and why limit it at all um, so uh over the summer, the invitations went out to, we are a group, I think now of 16. And uh, that's about as large as I think can function um, smoothly. Um, possibly we could add a few more. Um, but the uh, momentum grew and uh, someone suggested a, a web designer in London who was um, did beautiful work. And uh, I thought, okay, let's do this and let's make it look as nice as, as possible. And you were telling me recently that, so the, the blog has been going for six months, just about exactly. And how many, how many posts have happened in- Well, we, the first one came on October, 30th, Mark Burford wrote on Marian Anderson. Um, and that was October 30th, which is five and a half months ago. And we just posted our 24th 
post. So a little more than one a week, and that includes a few weeks off at Christmas. So um, it seems like a, a good pace. Um, and I think we can sustain that for a while, as long as we're having fun. Well, I think we're all having great fun. I can certainly say I've, I've really enjoyed it. And one of the things that I, that I enjoy most about it is, is the kind of public facing aspect of it. So much of what we do as scholars is ourselves with our computers and our notes, maybe writing to a small audience in an academic journal. And this has a, a much broader reach. And as I explained when I was talking with Thomas Hampson, the essays, the audio blogs, the video blogs are designed to be user-friendly, accessible, and for a broad audience. So the, the repertoire covered on the Women's Song Forum is very broad. And I'll be talking with people over the course of this month who, who explore songs by women from a variety of time periods and different genres. But the time period we're focusing on, so late 19th century, early 20th century, I imagine a lot of people, even perhaps classical music lovers, when they think songs by women composers in that time frame, late 19th century to early 20th century, they might think there probably aren't that many, right? We're just talking about five or six composers. Um, maybe I, you, know, you would think of Alma Mahler as one example, um, married to a, a fam famous male composer. But in fact, there are a lot more than that. So Marion, you've done so much work on this, this repertoire. Can you give us a sense for how many composers are we talking about? And uh, even if it's not a specific number, what, what's, um, how, how many composers are we talking about? And in what context were they, were they writing songs? In what context were women writing songs in this time period? Well, in, in America, there was the rise of the women's club movement in the late 19th century. So women were organizing all over America. Uh, we often think about them organizing for political reasons, but they were also organizing for artistic reasons. So there were music clubs. Um, by about 1930, there were 3,000 music clubs across America um, in the National Federation of Music Clubs. And even women's clubs that didn't concentrate on music often had music as a big part of their activity. So uh, the General Federation of Women's Clubs was a huge organization. And even little towns would have three or four clubs. So I, I like to give the example in Iowa, in the period in which there were only 2 million people in the entire state, there were 900 women's clubs that were members of the General Federation. And wow. if they meet every month and you know, have a song at some point on their program or um, have a, a music division that puts on a monthly or even bi-monthly event with music on it. There's a lot of opportunities for, for music by women. Um, and so publishers would market women's songs to these women's clubs. Arthur Schmidt was a publisher that often marketed uh, music to clubs then and you know so we think of these clubs as amateur organizations and they're written up in the society pages not in the arts pages but often women who were professionals who were teachers who were church musicians um, or who were just professional musicians were were also members of these clubs and in some places they could be very large the musicians club of women in um at its height had 634 members. That club still exists in Chicago. Um, and uh, sometimes clubs really ran subscription concert series. So you could be a member of the club and not perform. So uh, there was a club in Columbus, Ohio that literally had 3,500 subscribers. So there's a lot of activity all over America. So there's a huge market for, for songs for people to sing and, and specifically for women to sing and women composers really met that need. It sounds like one thing worth remembering is that, I mean, we might think of these clubs as, you know, they're, they're public events and that people can come, but they might seem sort of um, small events where, where women are performing pieces. But in fact, you're suggesting, you're saying that, that these pieces were published and they were marketed to these clubs. So there was, there was a wide, um, there was a lot of activity in publishing this, this music. And I know that Chris, you um, have been working for many years to get your hands on some of these pieces. Could you tell me how, how that began? So you have a collection at, at UC Davis, which has 
what, 700 different pieces? Is that right? From No, no, no. Seven, it's about 7,000. Oh, 7,000. I missed a zero. Yeah. So 7,000 yeah. pieces yeah. written by women between, uh, what, 1850 and 1950, right? Is that the, the rough time? Well, uh, the earliest ones in my collection are from the 1790s, mm. so, uh, attributed to a lady, um, a British woman. And uh, the latest are probably from the 1970s, but these are women like uh, Eleanor uh, Remick Warren who were publishing much earlier. Um, I don't, I don't um, have, I think, anything in my collection that was published by a woman who wasn't already publishing by the 1930s. And how did you find some of these scores? What, what, well, uh, where, where did you I, find some of the pieces in your collection? I'm shocked to realize that this is now um, an activity I've been engaged in for 30 years, or al just almost 30 years. It started in 1992. My wife and I were driving across the, com uh, the country, and this is a, a time before Sirius X radio and one thing or another. So. We amused ourselves by stopping in antique malls or antique stores um, and just walking around as if it were a museum. One of them had early on, um, maybe it was Montana, had uh, lots of bins of sheet music. And I started leafing through and uh, saw some things by women. I, I pulled out a few, I pulled out a few more. Maybe I left the store with a dozen, and I remember saying to my wife, I think I'll start a collection because there can't be too many of these. <laughs> Little did I know. And by the time I reached a thousand a few years later, or several years later, I, I started by realizing I was buying a song that I'd already bought before, or in a few cases, even twice before. So I thought, I need a database and um, uh, began simply to use that as a means of keeping track of what I owned. And that I realized should, could be something more. And um, songs often had advertisements for other songs. I had a year in London and spent a lot of time in the British Library, which has an amazing collection of, of songs. Um, and so now the database has over 20,000 songs by women who published between 1890 and 1930. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that is, um, that's quite a, a large number of women. Um, and of course, I, then, I, there, then there was eBay, right? Well, then there was eBay mm -hmm. and, you know, um, eventually my wife sat me down and said, you, you know, I, I really appreciate this collection, but you're spending way too much on it. So, um, so Mary, I, did I you, like you do you use eBay to find scores? I did, I did when I was writing my book on spoken word pieces uh, for women, which we can talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, I found a lot on eBay. In fact, this is how Chris and I met. He may not actually remember this, but um, we were both bidding on the same piece by the <laughs> California composer, Frida Pikey. And I thought, who could possibly want this? <laughs> other than me and you could still email people on on ebay at that point and so i emailed this person and said are you chris reynolds and he said <laughs> yes who are you <laughs> um but i knew it had to be him because i knew about about his collection so i love this so so you you only saw like uh, you didn't see his name you just saw some no, it was like, handle, uh, like like davis yeah, one two three four or something yeah you're like who is this person who keeps <laughs> outbidding me on these <laughs> and then you discovered it was chris I, I think on that occasion, Marianne, which I, I had forgotten, but I do remember, uh, I think on that occasion, I backed off and, and let you win. But I also know there are a few occasions where I thought, I don't care if Marianne loses to this. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> a little friendly you, rivalry. You do, you do have a few songs I don't have. <laughs> uh, those were probably the ones. Yeah. <laughs> So but Chris anyway, so um, I, you know, that database generated an article and another blog post for a different blog. And um, Steve, I wonder, you've got, I sent you some slides. Yeah. Maybe this is a good time because it indicates several things. Um, 
One is how ordinary it was for women to publish songs. So this graph that we see in front of us um, starts in 1890 and goes the first two decades of these four decades. The next slide will be the downhill slope, uh, but you can see a really steady rise. Um, and this is data based on over 18,000 um, titles. Um, the 23,000 figure is because, be although I'm focusing in this chart on 1890 to 1930, I, I include songs by the women that they published before 1890 or after 1930. But in those crucial four decades, there are over 18,000 publications. And this is not republications, there, which, of which there were many. These are first time publications. Um, so um, let's move on to the next slide. And you can see that when World War I hits, there is a, Oops, a decline. And then there is as World War I ends, uh, a big rise. Women were just celebrating in song. And so this is 987 songs published in 1918. Hmm. Um, and the year before and after, you can see uh, uh, the um, two of the highest figures that were reached. These are English language songs or songs in Spanish or French or German published, written, composed by women who were publishing in England or the United States or Australia or Canada, South Africa. Um, but of that 987, a huge number is American women all over from, you know, from large cities to tiny little towns not just in Iowa, uh, uh, but across the country. And indeed, some of these women weren't even living in towns, they were on farms. Um, so let's uh, now go to the next slide. Um, uh, okay, so you can see the decline is, is motivated by all kinds of things. I should say also- Question, this, sorry. How, what motivated the decline? Why do we see such a, a tapering off? Okay, um, there is a chart uh, in some study of people who purchased pianos that is not too dissimilar, that it rises to 1910 and then starts to decline. And I think that's because women who were the entertainment centers of, of families across the country until recordings started and then, uh, then um, silent movies started and then radio and after the war, people wanted to go out and dance. So, um, and then at the end of the twenties, national radio stations um, and movies with sound started. So um, it was not the depression so much as the roaring twenties that, that um, did this in. Um, so- I'm gonna move ahead. But, so this is the same number of of songs, but the blue line at the bottom is women who published just one or two or three songs. Initially in my collection, I thought, oh, this, this is not very significant. This is not important. And I didn't, I didn't make particularly an effort to purchase songs by women that were um, that occasional. But then I realized, no, this is a, a really important part of the story. So, you can see that both of these lines grow and actually they grow at a very similar rate. Um, um, I think the women who published one, two or three songs uh, quintuple in, their, in the number or, or more. And it's the same for uh, women who were professional, more professional, um, who published four songs and more. Um, so um, next slide. Just this is our, this will be our last, yeah. last slide. So there's this extraordinary phenomenon. If you're talking about the top line, the professional women, 1910 really is uh, the apex. And then there's a, a dip during World War I. Um, 
some women stopped publishing entirely during World War I. Cécile Chaminade, who's French, but um, was hugely popular in London and the United States. And so she's part of this table. Uh, World War I, she published her last song in 1916, um, even though she continued to compose for years after. But what just boggles my mind in this one is the response of these occasional women to the end of the war the, uh, or the entry of the, for the United States, the entry into the war, which was supported by women through song. Um, I mean, if you think of total war being a total societal experience, women were just as involved in, in their way, uh, pushing men into war. And you can see that in songs, usually encouraging or bursting with pride, but sometimes shaming. Um, so uh, the, for one year, the women who published one or two or three songs exceeded the total of, of professional women. Wow, that's fascinating. I mean, one thing that makes me realize just more broadly, so you're both music historians. I'm a music theorist, but I do a bit of music history. It seems to me that so often the history of music is told as we, we imagine sort of um, giants and usually they're, they're male giants, white male giants striding the earth, you know, these kind of great genius figures and, and there are a handful of them. And we think that that's the history of music, but this shows of course that the history of music making and music composition and music performance is, is vast and includes so many other people who were who were essential, who were vital to the to to the music being made in these time periods, and you can see that so beautifully in this in this chart, especially around the end of World War One. I'd I'd like to add that that some of my research extends Chris's research into the 30s, and I have been looking at the 38 boxes of poetry and songs that were sent to First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt in the 30s. And about half of them are by women, and often, often they are unpublished songs. So that that um, maybe this song culture continues, even though it's not documentable through through publication. Um, and I, I think what Chris is showing with the World War One um, happens to a certain extent also with World War II, there's an explosion of World War II songs in the papers of Eleanor Roosevelt, um, as you might imagine. And then between the wars, there are often, there are about 80 songs that are about establishing peace because there were some large women's peace organizations oh. as a response to World War I. So, um, and, and of course there's this amateur industry that will, if you if you write a poem, you can send it off and get somebody else to compose the, the music for it too. And and women and men are engaged in that as well. Because it's a it's obviously a money-making operation for someone, <laughs> these companies that that helped people publish song song mills. Yeah. 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 And am I right, Marion, that that um, women were sending songs that they wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt? Is that yes. Can, can you yeah. give us a sense for, like, what were they like? Who were these women? Uh, what was motivating them to do this? Well, they're, they're, well, Eleanor Roosevelt was very public figure and she asked the American people to write to her. And sometimes when people wrote to her, they sent her things. Um, so these women were everyone from professional composers. There, um, there's a song by Mary Carr Moore in her collection. There's a song by Manazuka. Um, who were professional female composers, but sometimes they're amateur women uh, composers and who, you know, who just write a song called Eleanor Roosevelt or they send a patriotic song or they send a song about Montana or they, you know, uh, the, the topics are incredibly wide ranging. And they often, some, sometimes it's the depression and they think, oh, I can sell this song and I'll, I'll, I'll make it big you know, um, or they want Eleanor Roosevelt to promote their song or send it to Marian Anderson or Kate Smith or someone famous who can sing it for them. And of course she can't, she can't do that. Um, but sometimes they're really heart-rending stories of, of people and they're, they're just their desire to express themselves. I, I brought one 
letter from a lady who lived in Virginia. Um, and I'll read you part of what she said to, to Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, Dear Mrs. Roosevelt, I'm writing you these few lines because you are a friend to everyone. I'm sending you a copy of a song. I would like to make you understand. I'm getting old now. I am not anybody. Never got no place in the world. Have no education, only dreams. Ever since I was a child, I wanted to write. I have wrote hundreds of poems that never amounted to anything. I wish you could see in this song all the dreams and hopes of a woman's life. I'm asking you to sometimes when you're with your friends who are interested in music to show them my little song and tell them an old farm woman up in Virginia wrote it. Maybe some of them would like it. I hope I have not asked too much of you. Your friend, Jenny Gein. Oh. <laughs> yes, oh. I, we I wept in the archive when I, when I found this oh, letter. But you know, there are other letters like this too, where people really pour out their soul to her. And, and it's clear how much this act of just writing one song means to them. And they want somebody who cares to, to pay attention to it. Do you think that's unusual, Marion or Steve? I mean, um, is this limited to the, the decades we're talking about at the moment? I, I, I wonder, you know, I, I've looked through the Roosevelt administration, which was very long. Um, I, you know, um, does President Biden and, and Dr. Biden, do they get songs from the American people? I don't, I don't know, maybe they do. Well, there are, there are examples of, you know, of course, we're, we're living in an era where people are writing songs with digital audio workstations. That's the, the tool at their disposal, as opposed to, say, a piano. And, you know, NPR does tiny desk, desk concerts, and they'll solicit tiny desk recordings from people all over the country and then pick the one out of, like, you know, 10,000 submissions that they that they like best. So there's a, there's a, today, if we kind of translate what you're talking about to the present day, there's still so much amateur music making. And I feel like the, the big lesson is that, that it's, it's the amateur and sometimes less public facing music making that is just as vital to, to music history and, and to culture as, as the music making by, by the composers that, that we know best. And one Absolutely. thing that- And our historical construction of women is to think that they are all amateurs right yeah. that they, they're not as visible as male composers um and actually it's a it's a range from the farm wife up to amy beach who had an international career so there's there's everything in between i think when it comes to women composers that's a that's a great point i feel like that's a nice segue to discussing some of these uh women composers that, you, that you've written about and i i think your your point is really well put marion that we shouldn't think that, well, women were kind of writing amateur music, but it's really important music. There were professional women composers who were, who were doing works that, that reached a really wide audience, and they were as professional as any other composer of their day. And one of those composers, Chris, whom you've written quite a bit about is, is Carrie Jacobs Bond. And I thought perhaps we could pivot toward, toward her and begin to zero in on a, a few composers that were, that were writing during this time period. Could you, uh, I know you're working on a biography about Carrie Jacobs Bond and you've, uh, you, you wrote something on the Women's Song Forum about one of her most famous pieces. Could you tell us first just who was she for people who may not have any idea who, who she was, who, who was she, what was she doing? Why is she an important figure? Uh, Carrie Jacobs Bond is an extraordinary woman who um, as she thought was born in 1862 actually I've discovered she was born a year earlier. So in any case, she was born during the Civil War in Janesville, Wisconsin, uh, to people who had, who had moved out from Vermont a decade earlier. Um, and uh, she died in 1946, so just after World War II. She married at, at the age of um, 18 or 19. Um, and had a, a child, a boy, uh, and quickly divorced the husband. Um, it was not as unusual as you might think in the, in the 1880s to divorce, and then married a man who probably had been her sweetheart um, all along, 
uh, and moved to a mining town in Upper Peninsula, Michigan. And so and until her mid thirties, she was not involved in any professional um, activity, and really not in any musical activity until her husband uh, died. Um, uh, probably accidentally, there, it's not out of the question in my mind that there was an accident plus suicide. Um, uh, he was walking along in December on an elevated sidewalk um, in Iron River, Michigan. And the story was a child threw a snowball at him. He fell off the elevated sidewalk and ruptured something and died four or five days later. So she went to Chicago, actually first back to Janesville, but to Chicago because she had already begun to help with family finances by publishing a few songs. Um, and she, she worked and she worked and she worked uh, seven difficult years. She published uh, seven or eight songs uh, and realized that she was never gonna make a living with $35 a song that was what she was getting from a publisher. So she thought, I have to publish it myself. I have to publish these things myself. And um, she befriended, like she must have been an incredibly charismatic woman because she, she made very influential friends who went out of their way to help her. Uh, the governor of Illinois' wife became a major patron. Uh, David B Bisfam, um, uh, one of the leading tenors of, of his day, a man who went out of his way to perform songs by women. Um, but she did a, uh, he did a recital that was all of her, just her songs, and that helped put her on the map. Um, she wrote in, in all 180 songs, she published 180 songs, which puts her number seven on my list of most prolific women. There is no one, uh, you're gonna laugh at the comparison, but there is no one other than Beethoven that I can compare her to for one thing, the importance of her biography, the importance of her life story to people who appreciated her music. Um, she toured and she toured and she toured small towns in Iowa. Is, she, cut, she really became Carrie Jacobs Bond, touring women's clubs in Iowa. So um, Marion's work is really interesting. Yes, yes, Iowans like to claim she was from Iowa. They wanted, you know, she was so famous that they wanted to make sure that Dvorak and Carrie Jacobs Bond were actually <laughs> Iowans. In well, their she claimed to have been reborn in Marshalltown, Iowa. And it's true because uh, she had very influential club women um, arranging her tours for her. Um, and she, she performed her own pieces? And she, she performed over and over and over, thousands of performances. Um, she would go on cruises and gravitate to the um, piano in the music room and, or stay in hotels and gravitate to the piano in the, movie, in the, in the um, uh, dining room or the music room if there was one. Um, she began recital after recital with a disclaimer. I'm not a singer. Uh, but she routinely moved people to tears and to laughter. And you see the, these reviews from all across the country, Alabama, New York, um, Illinois, California, Honolulu, where they talk about her audiences alternately weeping and laughing. Um, and it's because she would tell her life story and there is a life story behind all of her important songs. So I Love You Truly is a song she wrote after her husband died. And many of, many of her songs she wrote after her husband died. I love you. I love you. I, 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 
Sorry, I don't want to. Sorry, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, it, didn't that song get done at weddings a lot? I love you. All too. through the 20th century. All through the 20th century. Yeah. It's a um, standard. Chris, she, when, remind me, when did she die? 1946. So what, um, uh, what, what happened to her music and the, the kind of reception of her music after she died? Did I mean, it sounds like well, she was she was hugely popular throughout the country. Her did her she, big song, uh, "A Perfect Day," or often called "The End of a Perfect Day," from 19. She wrote it in a poem in 1909 in Riverside, California, actually my hometown, uh, staying in the Mission Inn, a building I know well, after a day uh, driving around the so-called Inland Empire that ended on Mount Rubidoux, uh, watching a glorious sunset. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, this is something I can conjure up very, very easily. And she came back with the group of friends I think I know a few who were on that day with her. Um, and she wrote a poem which she came down to the dinner table and read to people. And extraordinarily for a hip song, this is not witty. It's not about sex. It's not about dancing. It's about friendship. When you come to the end of a perfect day and you sit alone with your thought, while the chimes ring out with a carol gay for the joy that the day has brought. Do you think that the end of a perfect day can mean to a tired heart when the sun goes down with a flaming ray and the dear friends have to part? Very sentimental. And you, you can think, oh, I can see why women of the era would enjoy it. But in fact, Men loved this song. World War I soldiers loved no song more than this. It was sung in trenches. It was sung in hospitals. It was sung at fundraisers in England. Um, uh, there was a, a, a male quartet called the Shrapnel Quartet that went around singing this song. The Shrapnel Quartet, the men were all blind because they had been hit with shrapnel. Two didn't have an arm, others didn't have legs. Uh, and these, this was a very successful group. When the news of the war's end hit New York City, four men set out from Central Park singing the end of a perfect day and marched all the way to Madison Square Gardens. And by the time they got there, there were 4,000 people singing this song. Wow. This is a song that was a hit year after year after year. Uh, by the time she died, estimates were that she had sold 6 million copies of sheet music and 5 million records with this. And, and because she designed the cover, wrote the words, wrote the music, and um, published it herself, we're not talking about 2%, 2 3% royalties. We're, she made everything along with her son, Fred, who was her... Um, very, very competent uh, business manager. Can we can we listen to the song? I mean, after oh, that please. beautiful setup, I think we need to hear it. Um, okay. You you shared a recording with me, which I can play. And maybe before before I play it, Chris, could you could you tell us a bit about who, who the performer is, when this particular recording come from, comes from? And it sounds like you could have chosen among many, many different recordings of, of this song, right? Since I sent you two, which one are you going to play? This right. is the one by Webster Booth. Okay, Webster Booth, I believe this is 1947. He's a, a British tenor, a very sweet voice. What I like about this recording is that he doesn't drag the tempo which so many people do. There are 200 recordings of this song by you know, some of the best known singers, Rosa Poncel, um, uh, Bing Crosby, a huge range of, of singers. Didn't Mahalia and, but, Jackson also re record it? Ma Mahalia Jackson also recorded it, uh, uh, very slow. Carrie once complained, I didn't write this as a dirge. Well, that's often how it was sung, I'm afraid. But um, Webster Booth 
does a really good job. This is a recording with a theater organ. Uh, so it's not a piano. And there's no cello, which in the early years, it, there was often a, a solo cello doing a, essentially a duet. Well, let's give it a listen. I, I listened to it um, after you sent it to me, and I agree, his, he's got such a beautiful voice. So it's a really wonderful instrument. So here is A Perfect Day by Carrie Jacobs Vaughn. Excuse me while I go cry now. <laughs> it's such a beautiful melody. It's such a singable, well, not singable like that, I suppose, by most of us, but such a singable, beautiful melody. And with little subtleties, like the chromatic notes and the, yeah. the theorist, is, theorist in me is, is really enjoying it because it's, it's so artfully crafted. It, it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't strain itself too much, but it's got just the, the perfect amount of subtlety and expressivity. This, this song worked its way into the culture to an extent few songs do. Um, it became um, a phrase uh, that was used in, in plays and in movies and books and other songs. When General Pershing wrote um, uh, his diary on the day of the armistice, so the day that peace was declared, he ended it with, and this has truly been the end of a perfect day. So um, World War I soldiers from the very bottom of the ladder to the top um, knew this song. Uh, and it's partly that sense of the soul of a friend you've made. And I should mention uh, that Chris, you have a, a post about this song that, that touches on some of the things that you've mentioned on the Women's Song Forum. So, those of you who are watching who are also feeling moved or teary and, and wondering like, how did I not know this composer in this piece? You should go to the Women's Song Forum and, and read your lovely essay about this. It's piece. part one. Part two will deal with the World War I soldiers. But I sent you um, uh, a couple of cartoon 
If do we have time for that, Steve? If we sure, don't, we can, we can do that quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it became an image for advertisements, for postcards, for um, political cartoons. Um, so there, can you see? I'll move to the right slide. These are the slides we looked at before. Ah, is this the one you wanted to look at, Chris? Yeah, that's the main one. Uh, this is this is an image from July 1918. Gar Williams was a very widely circulated um, cartoonist working out of Indianapolis, and uh, so this is this is uh, the end of a perfect day. He's got a German by the britches and a cannon, and um, he's filthy. <laughs> Uh, but uh, he's happy he's alive. I mean, that, that I think was the sentiment that motivated a lot of soldiers to sing this song. But you can see drunks at lampposts um, singing the song, you, people uh, in bars singing the song in various cartoons. So it was an image that people saw over and over. So it sounds like if, if you were alive at the time this, this song was popular in the United States and someone said the end of a perfect day, you would know exactly what yeah. that line referred to, right? Yeah. It was that more popular. Well, thank you, Chris, for, for giving us the deep dive. One final question. Um, when, what's the status of the biography that you're writing? How, when can we, uh, when can we read it? <laughs> because we have it's a few years off. No, okay. I'm I'm at the early stages of writing. I have, I still have archives to visit, which I had intended to do this past year. Ha ha. Um, I I have begun writing, but I'm still also researching. Great. So the General Federation of Women's Clubs, at one point named the great women, you know, sort of, um, of the the previous fifty years. And the two women that represented music were the composer Amy Beach and Carrie Jacobs Bond, of course. And um, and we have a, a an Amy Beach biography, but now we need the Carrie Jacobs Bond yes, biography. Right. So glad right. you're running it. Stay tuned. So, Marion, uh, I really want to make sure that we have some time to talk about the elocutionists because you've written a really amazing book about. This, this practice that began in the late 19th century and extended into the 20th that involved essentially um, reciting words, poetry while music was playing. And this is something that you've not only written about but you've done yourself. And it's another really vital form of, of music making, song making by women in this time period that people may not know about. So can you tell us, give us a thumbnail sketch of what who were the elocutionists? What is this practice all about? And why, why is it something that, that we should, should know more about? It was very common for women to recite poetry. You know, if you studied speech, if you were a man, it would be because you would be a politician or a lawyer or a preacher. Um, but women were supposed to be able to recite poetry and entertain their families or educate their children. Um, but it became, elocution became a profession for women. There were elocution schools all over America. Elocution was taught in music schools. And so elocutionists, even though there were male elocutionists, it, it became a, a thing associated with women. Again, the same time as women's clubs, not every woman can sing, but most women can speak or can learn to speak in a, in a proper way. So um, it was also a socially acceptable way to perform in public without being one of those morally reprehensible actresses, right? Who have a bad association. Nice girls don't become actresses, but they can recite Tennyson or Edgar Allan Poe or, you know, you name it. Um, and because elocutionists often appeared on concerts um, or with, with uh, between the numbers of, of concerts, um, if they're performing with a pianist on a concert, it makes sense to have that pianist play background music or to, if, if the poem mentions a, a song for the pianist to play the song at that point, um, or you could recite a song. If you were not a singer, you could recite a song rather than sing it, which, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a good choral 
you know, church choir singer. I'm not a soloist. So this particularly appeals to me. Um, so it was a very, very common practice. And uh, there were pieces that were written, you know, very sort of formal, large compositions by men. Um, David Bispam, who sang Carrie Jacobs Bond, also recited Strauss, Enoch Arden, Tennyson poem with big piano accompaniment. But there were also little pieces written by women composers that were designed to be spoken rather than sung. Um, and sometimes publishers marketed pieces as being either a song mm. Or a spoke, or you could speak it. So if you weren't a great singer, which, and some of us aren't, um, that that was a way you could perform. And because these pieces are by women, they tend to be topics that would appeal to women. They're about children. They're about marriage. They're about courtship. But they can all, and they can be very sentimental. But they can also be very funny and very sarcastic. You know, like. It's a, it's a kind of girls' night out piece where there are no men in the room. You can make fun of courtship. You can make fun of marriage. Um, you can make fun of men. Um, and so these pieces, uh, so I wrote a whole book about this and afterwards thought, you know, these are really clever little pieces. M maybe somebody ought to perform these. Hmm, I wonder who I can get to perform <laughs> these. And I, I wrote a grant and hired a, a wonderful pianist named Natalie Landowski and we became a duo named Red Vespa. Um, uh, it was an experiment. I didn't know that if this would work um, and it seems to have worked. When, whenever I perform the, Natalie and I go and perform these, um, particularly for women's audiences, we get an excellent reception. I have to say we get a little less good reception uh, if the higher the number of men in the audience, um, in, unless they're musicologists and music theorists, and then then they're always uh, fun to perform for. But, um, and then the, the other exciting thing about it is people come up to me afterwards and say, can I, can you send me the scores for these? Um, and so I'm hoping I'm starting a little revival of, of this, this genre. Um, it, one reason we don't know about this genre is because it was by women. Um, we also don't know about it because there was really no sort of hard and fast name for it. It was sometimes called a piano log, musical reading, musical recitation. So, so some of the songs in Chris's collection, a few, are actually um, this kind of piece. And uh, it, it's they're, they're delightful, I think. They, one question I have, and I, I think you've really answered it, the, these were published, right? So it's yeah. not just that they sort of did them at these um, women's events and then they kind of dis disappeared. Like, are they, uh, you obviously have accessed them and, and brought them back to life. Yeah, so but if so there, someone wanted to find them, where would, where, would they, where would they find them? Sometimes on eBay, um, some, sometimes in Chris's collection. Um, I, I really probably ought to put out an addition, but um, how do you how do you pronounce the woman's name P E Y C K E because she did lots and lots of these. Yes, yeah. um, the two major composers are Frida Pikey, who lived in the L.A. area, and she wrote about three hundred and forty of these, publishing about a fourth of them. The other leading figure was Phyllis Fergus, who lived in Chicago and really, you know, worked the, the Chicago Women's Club circuit. And she wrote about 60 of them. She does have one larger serious setting of The Highwaymen um, by Alfred Noyes, which is very melodramatic. It's not funny. And she, it was complicated. So she would get someone else to recite. She got a woman to recite named Beatrice Wells. And um, she also taught piano lessons to Beatrice Wells's son, Orson Wells, the future movie director. Um, so, so these were the two leading figures. There were other, other women as well. And there are some of these pieces by men too, but they're predominantly by women. Marion, you sent me video recordings of, of you and your collaborator. And what's, what's her name again? Her name is Natalie Landowski. And Natalie she's a, a professor of piano at Western Illinois University now. Um, this, this recording, I have to say, is our very first performance. Um, we have done a lot of performing since then. And I, I will say that the laugh track is supplied by my brother, who was in the audience and thought it was really hilarious to see his little sister doing this. Which, which one would you like to 
show us. You you sent us a, a Phyllis Fergus piece and let's, a Frida Pike piece. Yeah, let's do Fergus. Okay. Oh, um, little little note on slang. This uses the word spoon, which is um, what you do with your sweetie. At, you know, you spoon with them. The sea and the sand of a summer resort and a man and a maid and a moon <laughs> soft and sweet nothings love's favorite sport as nightly they sit and they sleep. A whisper, a promise, and summer is over. They part in hysteric despair. But neither returns the following June for fear that the other is there. <laughs> This is typical in that there's usually a punchline at the end, right? It, it's everything goes along perfectly normally. And then at the end, there's a little twist um, and, and you get a laugh. It, it, it works. And, and, and usually the musical accompaniment helps with the laugh. There's, there's usually a little musical punctuation as well to, you know, like the drum shot, right? <laughs> if you're a comedian, but um, in this case, it's in the piano. It strikes me. It strikes me that uh, in an era when silent movies were presented with piano accompaniment or organ accompaniment, this would have just seemed perfectly normal. That's a great point. You're right. I remember Marianne first hearing one of these. I don't think it was that particular performance, but it was at an AMS American Musicological Society conference, and I sort of popped in, and I left thinking. <laughs> I think that's like the best thing I've ever heard. It was just so <laughs> virtuosic and side-splittingly funny and the timing was amazing. And I, I have to say that you were saying earlier that you thought who might be able to do this? I think you were made to do this. You're really, really <laughs> gifted. And I'm so glad to see that that you're continuing to, to do them and that Red Best yeah, it's, it's It's been a tough year. We haven't performed in a year. Um, and, and, and I have to say, I. I could not do this without Natalie. Um, and it, it really takes a certain amount of rehearsal to get the piano and the spoken word together because there is no rhythmic notation for the spoken word. You, you have to figure out how it's going to fit. And one thing is I have heard Frida Pikey perform because she did make some recordings and what she does and what's on the page are completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a kind of flexibility in the style that has to be learned. And, and, and Natalie and I have started to joke that, that when, you know, when you have to manipulate something rhythmically, what we call that doing a pikey, because the, perform <laughs> the performance practices are not necessarily like it, like it looks like on the page, but, but yeah, we hope we, we have a grant to make a, a longer, more substantial video. And hopefully after COVID, we can do that. Um, and we, I have also commissioned a composer named Lisa Nair to write us some new serious pieces, which I'm hoping to premiere as well. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to revive the whole art form. I'm so, so glad that you're, that you're doing this. It's, I mean, I have to say that I guess like so many people, I just didn't know that this even existed. And I think that seems to be a theme of our conversation that, that there are these vital central creations, art forms by women that shaped culture, that, that were shaped by people's lives. I mean, the, the, the letter that you read, um, someone writing to Eleanor Roosevelt, her entire experience is sort of, is, is funneled into that song. And yet, we we need to to spend more time with this with this repertoire which brings me to a final question so we've we've talked about the vast number of songs written by women that 
that people wouldn't know about. We've talked about Carrie Jacobs Bond, a, a major figure, a major figure who deserves to be better known. And then this art form that deserves to be better known that, that people are, thanks to you, Marion, are now more aware of. My question for both of you is, what, what is needed going forward to continue to shine a light on these different genres, these different pieces, these different composers, so that so that we can bring it to an even wider audience. And I'll let either one of you start. What what do you, what's your wish? What what do you think we really need going forward to to maintain the momentum and to continue to shine a light on this repertoire? Well, I I think there's so many women who are understudied. You know, if someone the with the cultural position of Carrie Jacobs Bond is understudied. The, the women who are maybe not Carrie Jacobs Bond, but who were still incredibly important song composers um, deserve the kind of attention that Chris is giving Carrie Jacobs Bond. So there's that. Um, and then just hearing these songs and, and having people program them. You know, one of the things I do in my work is look at concert programs from earlier time periods. And, and I look at them and there are women's songs on them all the time. And, and then I go to concerts and there are sometimes women's songs. So I think performances um, as well as more research into women would be a wonderful thing. You know, for, for students out there, there is plenty of research to do, you know, think, think of what's in Chris's collection. We need, we need performances though, and we need performances by major singers. Um, the, the amount that's available on YouTube is actually in its way impressive, but you go to look for songs by say the, uh, Lisa Lehman, who is the number one in terms of publishing um, in this era, 370 songs I've, that I've identified. And I'm not convinced that's all. Um, uh, there are very, very few recordings of her songs and she is an incredible composer. So um, if anybody wants ideas of things to perform, anybody watching this, contact me or Marion or Steve, um, you know, we've got ideas. Yeah, yes, more recordings would be a wonderful thing. Well, my hope is that those of you watching who are performers, uh, who are interested in this repertoire, will, will take up this, this call to action and contact Chris, contact Marion, contact me go to the Women's Song Forum where you'll find even more examples of, of songs by women composers and get these things out in the world because I, I think you're both right that we, we need better performances so that we can use them in our classes, so that we can use them in, in forums like this. Thank you, Marion and Chris for the conversation. It was so fun to, to learn more about what you do. And thank you all for, for watching this conversation. I hope that you, that you learned something from it. This is, but one of three conversations that I'll have with dear friends and colleagues about songs by women. Next week, I'll be talking with Mark Burford and Carol Oja about their work. And we'll discuss among other things, Marian Anderson and Mahalia Jackson. And then the week after that, I'll be talking with two scholars who are forerunners in the studies, study of art songs by women composers in the 19th century, Larry Todd and Susan Wallenberg. And we'll talk about among other things, the songs of Fanny Hensel. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Marion. Thanks everyone for watching. <laughs>